What, what's happening in the marketplace, Dustin? So what I'm seeing in the marketplace, a couple of different things. One thing that I'm really, really seeing is that if you're an investor, you need to be excited because people, yeah, it's easy to invest in 2021, 2022, yep. because the market's going up. People are like, I could just fall into a property and make money. You know, let's say it's a short-term property, which we've seen so many Instagram and TikTok gurus come on is since 2021 yeah. saying, sure. I have four properties and I make a million dollars. Well, mm -hmm. it was easy back then. Now here's the great thing. So for commercial real estate, as well as even single family homes, I see a stagnation in the, um, uh, I guess, amount of people that are brought, buying it. Like there's, there's so few deals right now. Transactions are way down. Loan. Yeah. Yes. It's way, way down. But what's happening is because of interest rates. Now, what I'm totally seeing is that I'm excited for the next year, 24 months, I, like next two years, there's going to be so many deals. Let me quickly, one last thing I want to give, because I want you to jump in. I bought a 355 unit apartment complex with, I was a general partner with other general partners. And we bought it for 60 cents on the dollar because the seller was distressed. They had another project they were losing money on. They needed to sell this. They owned it for 14 years. Mm -hmm. Like, let's just offload it. But we bought it for 60% of the market value. So we captured 40% in equity. And this is a $32 million property. So right. I'm seeing that for single family homes. And then especially for apartment complex, because I know Brandon Turner, he has, you know, he touts, oh, I have 15,000 units or whatever it might be. Sure. But he literally stopped all distributions. And probably, I'm not saying he will, but just like lots of other companies, syndicators, they're like salesmen. They flip um, apartment complexes. They fit, flip multi-family. And so totally. they just kept getting deals and deals and deals and deals they should not have gotten. And mm -hmm. now they're going to have to sell those or fire sell or be taken back from the bank. So I'm super excited that these distressed properties, you and I, we're going to be able to buy them up. Yeah, we're seeing the same thing. So we, we talk to a lot of people. I mean, we're, I'm in the market. We have clients that are in the market. It's, it's hard to find deals. Um, and when they are deals, they're screaming hot deals. Because you find the person at the right time who's they've 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 exercised every other option and they just need out. Mm -hmm. That's, how they, how did y'all find out, and they they need to get and the reason why, because you might be thinking, somebody, you know, if you're listening, you might be thinking, well, why do they need to get out? The biggest right. reason they need to get out is if you buy a single family home, you get 30 year fixed, you just keep going and eventually it's paid off commercial, totally different. It could be right. a storage facility. It could be a mobile home park. Like think of commercial as, as commercial real estate and apartment complex is obviously the same thing. They got in bad loan. Let's say bad. They got in loans thinking that they could refinance or they can sell the house or the property very, very quickly. And it's a three to maybe five years Balloon. is usually the term or they have to refinance or sell. And now those people that bought in 2021, well, that three years is coming up, especially the ones that got a hard money type of yeah, loan a short term loan. three years yes yeah it's the short term uh high interest loans or and they can't refinance it's on the lower because now the interest rates are higher or they got really good terms three to five years ago and now the balloon's coming due and the new interest rate makes it so that they can't cash flow and they can't sell it they can't sell it for more than they bought it for because that's always the goal remember right like what i you and I are investors. We're not syndicators. Syndicators, they're flippers. That's really basically what they try to do. Yeah. But I'm an investor. And so when I invest, I make sure I capture equity. These syndicators, they were paying top dollar for these properties because they knew they made money when they brought cash in from investors. Mm -hmm. They made money and then on the transaction. And so uh, you and I, like I'm I'm licking my lips. Like this is going to be so delicious. Mm -hmm. All these properties are going to be on the market. All, even single family homes. The same thing, like these Airbnb properties that, you know, 2021 people just started buying all of them. There are 50,000 Airbnb and short-term properties in Arizona alone, just Arizona, let alone all the other huge cities that have so many. Well, these were long-term properties for long-term tenants or yeah. buy and hold, which those are off the market now. Well, they're so saturated now that Airbnb, they lost 20% in stock on the stock market um, and on the, the price of their stock in yeah. like four weeks or three weeks. Like it just, just crashing because they are losing money. So I'm seeing so many great things, <laughs> right? You might be thinking, listening to it. Oh my goodness. There's so many bad things going on. Yes. But if you are doing or causing this bad thing, you're participating, which Paul and I don't. And obviously if you listen to Paul's show, you, you don't do the same thing as they're doing. You're doing what we would do 
as investors being wise and buying the right properties? Yeah, let's clarify um, the the whole syndication thing. So uh, uh, are you saying that you won't syndicate or you're just not an air quote syndicator? Syndicator, I am not by far. Right. I'm an investor right. and I won't invest my money in something that's not good. And I won't uh, syndicate or like bring on any investors if I'm not investing my own money. Because right. Paul, you and I, we have a lot of integrity. And if I lost my money, which I've lost plenty of money before, it'd mm -hmm. be a bummer, but I would hate, hate, hate to lose somebody else's money. And so I only bring on deals because I've invested in some deals that aren't doing very well and sure. somebody else's deal. That's a bummer, yep. but I didn't yep. bring it out to other people, but right. I don't mind bringing on investors. I'm not syndicating. I'm literally bringing on investors to me to be a part of everything that I'm doing. Does that make sense? So they're, so they're either JV partners or like co-sponsors in a deal for, with you? Uh, yes. Yeah. They, uh, or LPs. Like I'm totally okay. fine with somebody. I just want to park my money with you, Dustin, because I trust you. Right. I'm like, please go right ahead. In fact, uh, for the 355 unit apartment complex we bought right outside of Nashville, um, I sent out a few emails, a couple of podcast episodes on my show, raised $1.5 million. And so right. I was like, man, that was first time ever doing it. I was like, man, that was pretty fun. But th the biggest thing was everybody literally said, I'm investing in you. Now this deal looks great, but I'm investing in you. The last thing I want is my integrity or reputation to fall falter. And so I'm only bringing deals that I'm like, this is either a home run or a grand slam. Same, same. So um, I have not nearly the size of that property, but I have a, I have a property that's under contract that has uh, some upside to it, but I'm buying it for the native cash flow, right? And Wait, we're did you qualified. Say negative cash flow? N native, native cash flow. Native, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, we don't want negative cash flow. <laughs> it's like, Paul, that doesn't sound like you. <laughs> negative. <laughs> uh, words that I hope will never come out of my mouth is I I wouldn't purposely <laughs> bought negative cash flow. It's like, yes. it's like never buy an alligator. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. I, this, I also right now have another, um, property that I might become a, a GP on Annie uh, Dickerson, you know, we're friends, yeah, yeah. friends with them. Um, she asked me to be a part of this another property. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at the cash flow was amazing on this property. And so I'm really strongly considering it. And like I said, well, right now I was talking, well, I was just talking to an, an attorney and a syndication attorney. She, she focuses on multifamily commercial properties. And mm -hmm. she said, there's so little deal flow right now. Like it's her business is not doing well, or uh, sorry, that's, that's a rough way to say it. She's seen better days is probably the best way to say it. Yeah. Uh, but because there are so few deals going on right now, and that means that there are people just given enough time, another six months, you're going to start seeing a lot of capital calls from these syndicators. You're also going to see properties hit the market that you and I are going to be gobbling up. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people are are actively waiting and expecting for the Fed to lower rates, and like we're we're coming up. Even by the time this comes out, we may have news about if they actually lowered the rates for the first time in September. What so you, so um, whoever's watched listening to this is going to have foreknowledge based on what we're saying right now. Um, what do you think? What's what 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 did your tea leaves say? So I definitely know that, or at least no, when I say no, I'm like almost 99% per certain that they're going to lower rates and we got an election year and, yeah. you know, any incumbent is always going to try to make the economy better. So it looks better yeah. on them, which is completely understandable. That's just what they want to do when they push the yeah. Fed and all that sort of stuff, which the Fed is just a bunch of banks. It's not a federal like organization, part of our government. It's, it's, just the, a bunch it's of banks. the non federal Fed. <laughs> it, it is. So what I'm seeing is rates will come down but it's not going to come down enough to save these companies because the reason why rates are coming down is because the Fed is seeing problems in the economy. Yeah. When problems come in the economy, there's not loose money anymore where investors, oh, you, you know, a syndicator brought me a deal. Yeah, you said 9% uh, preferred return. Great. Let's go ahead and, you know, put, put money in there. There's not, people are gun shy now. People yeah. are really gun shy because they've been burned by, like, just imagine you, you said, you know, I'm going to flip houses or I'm going to invest in somebody who flips houses, but then eventually this house flipper gets stuck with a house because the market drops. It doesn't matter what interest rate is. People just aren't buying. Then you're stuck. Same thing with this, these, uh, you know, multifamily properties, commercial properties. Now, as you and I invest, 
if people listen to your show and they start, you know, how does Paul invest? That, that, if you're listening, it that's what you should be thinking. How does Paul invest? How does Dustin invest? Mm -hmm. We're going to tell you how we invest because we're protecting our money and we're going to protect your money just like it's ours. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. When you do raise capital from investors and they invested in your fund and your deal and your syndication, I, I take that very personally. Uh, they put a lot of faith in in you. And like you said, they're investing based on the trust that they have built in you and that they think that the deal may have, may have some merit, but they're really investing in you uh, because you've put yourself out there. And in my case, I put myself out there as somebody who's experienced, who's been around for a while, right? Absolutely. How, and how, how many years now have you been in the business? 2006, I started investing in real estate, bought a couple small multifamilies, but mostly uh, residential. I love residential long-term. I mean, yeah. there's so many great things about residential. Um, one sure. biggest thing now that I'm older, I have five kids now, I will literally give these properties to my kids. Yeah. You know, when you have multifamily, it's a little harder to do that. And so bread and butter, residential, make lots of money, give those to my kids. Now I've been doing multifamily for, well, you know, small multifamilies for a long time now, but now getting into larger deals. The larger scale. Um, yeah. and, yeah, larger scale in the last maybe six months to a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I made that transition as well um, from single family where I cut my teeth, um, and to and then later saw some advantages of multifamily or commercial. What were your reasons for making the switch? Because there's pros and cons, and let's maybe talk about those. Yeah. The biggest thing that I loved growing up was playing Monopoly, you know, getting with my my parents and my <laughs> brother and we would play Monopoly. And now my kids are playing Monopoly and that stuck with me. It's how like somebody smart more than likely did invest in real estate or knew something about real estate. It was, it's a game all about real estate and the way you win is you make more money by having bigger properties and eventually getting a multifamily like hotels. Uh, so uh, two or three years ago, I started, I invested in some hotels, which was fun. I got to like, oh, I accomplished Monopoly. I, you actually I have more hotels. The, yes, I actually did invest in some hotels. Uh, but that was the whole thought was, you know, when I have single family homes, those are fantastic, but there are some downsides. When you have multifamily, those are fantastic too. There are downsides. As a real estate investor, everybody needs to have... I believe a bread and butter, this is something that you personally can do and you know so well, because there's so many different asset classes, you can also mm -hmm. jump to or jump, uh, start investing in other asset classes like storage facilities to yep. mobile home parks to hotels. Like, but you don't have to be the expert in that. And that was a great thing about creating the Real Estate Wealth Builders Conference, was I got so many more people around me, experts like you, Paul, that I don't real I, I literally do not want to be the one finding properties. I honestly don't even want to do any underwriting. Like that's not me. I'm more of a people person. Yeah. I'm more asset management too, because I, I I like doing that, but I love raising capital. And so for me, what I realized was I can grow into other assets, but I don't have to be the expert. Mm -hmm. And that was easily the way that I jumped into other things. And so now I'm also looking if the economy does change is I would love to get in storage facilities because sadly, if people lose their homes, they got to park their stuff somewhere and it's storage facilities are going to be really good in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So there's a couple of points there that I would like to reinforce. Uh, one of the things that I like to tell folks is invest in what you natively understand or invest in what you understand the most. And and I, I like when I'm speaking, I'll, I'll raise the questions. Like everybody who listening to this, raise your hand if you live in an apartment, a, a house or a mobile home. And so of course the answer is everybody. So you natively understand it. Like you know what a kitchen is and what you, what people want in a kitchen, right? Uh, so you, there's less to learn. Whereas when you're jumping to storage or, uh, you know, different type like retail or like, I mean, you know, warehouses, I mean, it's just a different business because you don't know the, de the, the, the demand and what's good and what's bad as readily for most people. Well, and I don't want to learn that whole new thing. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, now, when I was younger and I was really young, like I learned all about multifamily. So I know how to do it because I was really yeah. close to buying a property. Long story short, I learned it, but I don't want to be the expert in that. Now I'm expert I in multi, uh, single family home for you. residential. Love that. I'm expert uh -huh. in that, but I don't want to learn something brand new, especially as you get older. Let's say if you're 60 years old, you're like, man, I'm going to retire soon. I need to have a better nest egg or whatever it might be. Well, 
partnering with people or investing with other people who are the experts that you trust. That's the mm -hmm. big, like, obviously you're, you know, Paul, Paul's trustworthy, just like myself. We hold our integrity very, very high. That's why Paul and I get along so well um, among many other reasons. Mm -hmm. And so if you are in that boat, it's like more than likely you don't want to learn something all brand new. Now, if you do, Great. More power Jump to you. All yeah. in. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Now there's, um, and Paul, you're going to come speak at the Real Estate Wealth Builders Conference that we're putting on in November. It's the multifamily and commercial real estate investing uh, conference. And we're putting that on because we had so many people asking for more detail, more really? like strategy. Yeah. More tactics on how to do multifamily. And I saw a huge opportunity in the market that we're getting entering the best time to be investing in real estate. There's going to be pennies on the dollar, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I I was, that, that was kind of where I was going next uh, with, with my curiosity is you're already doing the wealth builders conference that is kind of is, is it's real estate, but it's, it's not asset class specific, right? Uh, you right. can, you know, it's more beginner level and it's sort of like anybody in your, it's like a, a smorgasbord of options, right? And then you're like, hey, you know, we're doing this thing in in um, is it Denver, right? Um, yep. You should you should, you, should, you told me you, you should book your flights. Uh, you, you should come out to Denver. And I was like, well, what for? Um, and it was like, well, we're doing a commercial thing, and I, and you do commercial, so well, you know, you, you should come speak. I'm like, how crazy are you to run another conference? And you did it again with like very short notice. Yeah, I am. I, either a glutton for punishment or it's just a passion, which it's the latter. I yeah. honestly, it's a passion of mine to help people. Um, and I'm also pretty ambitious, meaning not like making money. It's like, I can do this. Like I, I didn't want to wait till 2025 to do it. I was right. thinking, you know what? We came off of RubeCon 25 in March. The mm -hmm. one that you're saying it's all, it's all asset classes, really, really strong. We had a great turnout. We should be able to do a multifamily conference. And I want to start it as quickly as possible so we can get momentum because I really want to help 1 million people to invest in real estate, whatever asset class it is. This is just another iteration of how I can do that. And I want the multifamily conference to be where people are starting now, because if you start after the big wave of great investment and deals. If you start after that, you might catch a little bit, yeah. but what I want people to do, just like surfing, I went surfing this last weekend. I was in the, on the coast and I was teaching my kids how to surf. And when you're surfing, you do not wait for the wave to get to you and then expect to catch it. If you have not built up any you momentum, you haven't, yes, you see it coming and then you start paddling. You paddle before the wave gets to you. And then once it gets you, then it picks you up and you already have the momentum you take off. That's the same thing with education, contacts, like network, other people around you, other experts, people that are doing it with you. And that's why I created the conference because I see something coming and I want to get as many people on board as possible. Success loves speed. It loves sure speed. Does. And yep. business success loves speed and focus. That's what I found. That's, that's something that you and I both definitely share is the focus. Like once I get, I, I usually always get just so focused on a goal, a task, um, whatever it might be, a, a, a deal. Um, I, I literally can't stop. I literally can't stop. I would stop. not want to be in front of you in an obstacle. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you lift weights, man. Uh, or you would just run right through me. I would not want to be in front of that obstacle. Holy smokes. Mm. So okay, what are so, you seeing in the market? Because I, I talked a okay. little bit about what, yeah, what are you seeing in the market? Uh, we'll share a lot of the same sentiments. So um, we're seeing transaction volume down. Um, we're seeing uh, the opportunity right now, not the one that's coming, the opportunity right now is seller financing. So huge. what we're doing now is we're actively looking for commercial deals and we have like a three-step questionnaire uh, or, or, or rubric that we're going through. Can I buy at a deep discount for cash? Can I assume great long-term debt that's at really favorable rates or you know, sub two, um, preferably assume will, um, because uh, I, I don't want to play the game of do on claw, do on sale with a big commercial transaction. Or the third one, which is my favorite and which we end up finding the most of is seller financing. And I'm talking like 3% interest rate seller financing, but I'm paying the seller's price. 
but I'm getting terms that work for me that make a cash flow with as little money down as possible. And I stretch out the payments as long as they'll let me. How are you finding those deals? Because that, that sounds amazing. I 100% agree, especially, uh, say, single family homes. Subject to is going on right now, and it's going to go gangbusters pretty soon. Um, yep. if, if, if the economy does change, where it's going to be bad, people are losing their homes or losing yep. their jobs, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, but how, how are you finding those deals? Is it um, knocking on doors like these you know, larger apartment complexes, you know, 50, 60 units? Mm. Uh, I like that size, 15, 60. Um, so I, I think the, the, you're looking for the mom and pop owners. Um, so between five and 50 is probably ideal. And, but it could be other asset classes like mobile home parks or RV parks or any sort of small business that a mom and pop might own. And we're I, ideally targeting uh, baby boomers. 65, uh, there are 10,000 people a day turning 65 in the U.S. The vast majority of them. Wait, wait, wait. Say that one more time. <laughs> how many 10,000 10, people a day oh my are, goodness <laughs> are turning 65 <laughs> so the baby boomer was a boomer generation there's a bunch of people born in a short amount of time and that wave is now retiring and they're aging retiring and I'm, there's like 78 trillion dollars of assets that the, the boomer gen generation owns that over the next uh 10 to 20 years will be transitioning from boomers to gen xers and millennials so will will all that uh, wealth transfer, no, some of it will actually disappear. So what we want to do is we want to catch some of those small businesses and let the cash flows of the business pay for our pay for us buying the equity from from them. Well, the, you said a word, two words could be how, however you write it, but uh, cash flow that is key, one hundred percent key. Now I know people say, okay, yeah, you can buy a not cash flowing property because you have lots of extra income that you need to get taxable or now the taxable income taken away. But mm -hmm. just like, like, why would you start a business to lose money? Like if you're going right. to teach your kid how to sell candy bars and make money, okay, son, buy it for a dollar. You sell it for 50 cents. That's how you, no, no, no. You're losing money. You don't do that. You want to make money in cash flow. And that's what what they say is cash is king. Well, mm -hmm. it's uh, people might try to change however that's worded, but it's absolutely right. If your business does not have cash, it goes out of business. If you very can't quickly, pay for very your, <laughs> yeah, very, very quickly, especially yeah. if somebody says, well, I just need, I have extra income over here from my job, my W2, a like doctor or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to buy this house and then I'm going to have this huge mortgage payment, but it's going to be great because I make, what if you don't have that job? And then you have this debt. And so you always, or at least my suggestion, that's why I love master passive income. Like the brand that I created a long time ago was yep. I want to master the passive income, the cash flow side, because that's what I feed my family on. That's why I don't have to work a job. And so if you buy any asset that doesn't cash flow, you're going to be hurting yourself in the end. That's, and so you, you brought up a couple of things that you're looking for in deals, like one kept capturing equity, like a huge discount cash flow is another great one that we're looking for. We, if it doesn't have cash flow, we don't even consider it. Right. But yeah, you, and you want to step into a deal or a business where there's there's cash flow and you get to uh, basically have the cash flow in exchange for management and maybe a small down payment. In some cases, our, our down payments are actually very, very small. So we're putting limited amount of cash out of our pocket and we're stepping into a business that they're done. And if you don't buy it from them, they're just going to shut the doors. So they they can't cash in their equity. So you have all the lever leverage and, and all the negotiating power because they need it worse than you do. And you know how to show up and make an offer that works for both you and them and allows them to retire off into the sunset with a stream of cash flow from business that they don't have to worry about anymore. That's a you brought up a great point. So a lot of people might think, okay, if I'm going to buy a house, uh, apartment complex, whatever it might be, if I'm going to buy an asset mm -hmm. and I'm going to pay them, let's say 60% of what it's worth, 70% of what it's worth, sure. somebody might be thinking, well, shoot, I'm like stealing it from them, man. I feel bad. Like, no, 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 no. You have no idea what the person, the seller, what circumstances are, you might be their knight in shining armor because right. they're so, their situation might be horrible and you buying at 60%, it's the best deal that they can find. They're going to thank you. So I, this has happened plenty of times for me and my students. I know for you as your students as well, is we look to see as best as we can to help mm -hmm. the seller. That's the biggest thing that we need to realize about real estate 
about anything in, in general, actually, it's about people. If you yeah. focus on the person, how can I help them get what they want? If, if I can benefit and they could benefit, then that's fantastic. So keeping that thought in your mind, if you're going to seller financing, subject to whatever it might be, where mm -hmm. you might be thinking, I might be hurting these people. No, no, no. If they don't want it, they'll, they won't, they'll tell you, no, I don't want it. You might be their knight in shining armor. Yes, I could not agree more. Uh, this is like salt of the earth people that have built their lives around this business in many cases, and they've been able to raise their families around it. And, but they never planned for an exit. They, they it, and you know, some people did, but the vast majority of them most don't didn't think about that. And they maybe thought that they would give it to their kids. The kids aren't interested for whatever reason. They're just not interested. And it, it's not going to become a family asset because there's no one to run it. And so they're looking for ways to sell it. And you asked me a while ago, like, where do you find these things? Well, you can market for it, but you can also just go to crexy.com and do a search nationwide and type in the word seller financing. Hundreds, if not thousands of them will show up. Just commercial real estate, not all the other assets, just commercial real estate. Hundreds, maybe thousands of options will pop up. And obviously you don't want them all, but it's there. Like I, I did it. Last week, and there were 518 listings in the U.S. that said just said seller financing in in the title. So, of that list, um, and, and so that's just seller. I could have typed in owner financing or owner will carry. You know, you can always do it different terms, right? Uh, what you can put in there. Uh, okay, so here, here here's here's the key. Just because someone says seller financing, they've put a, a label up there saying I will seller finance. That doesn't mean that there aren't other hundreds, if not thousands, of of Operate op opportunities out there that you could offer seller financing, but they don't know what that means yet. I, I've noticed that when I use up or bring up the term, the words seller financing, it can get a little, um, they don't understand it. They don't know what Most it people means. Don't. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing that like, if you want to, so if it, more than likely, if you're listening Here's some to some coaching, you're coming. Up. Yeah. Hey, yeah, exactly. <laughs> More than likely, if you're listening to this, you're going to be, you're an active investor and you're like, man, how do I actually approach these, these people, these, these, uh, mom and pops, these, ba these yeah. boomers that they're retiring. So if you approach them, oh, let's do seller financing. We'll make you the bank and all that sort of, like, if you start going in that direction, it doesn't really help necessarily so much. First thing, before you even talk about seller finance and bring up the, the thought of seller finance, you need to ask them. What, what can I do for you? Like, how can I help you? What would you like to see? Because that helps you to know how to structure your offer. You don't offer, okay, seller financing right away. This is, no, no. The first thing, remember, it's about people. Real estate's about people. So what you do is you figure out what they need. If you figure out what they need and can solve that, then you're going to have a huge, huge success. Now, also, mm -hmm. when you're thinking about seller financing, that term is not very... Um, it's hard to understand for a lot of people. They the the person owning it might be thinking, well, it's a lot of work on my end. We don't know what the connotation of what they understand seller financing right. means. Instead of saying um, seller financing, my suggestion is you could say, well, hey, I can pay cash, which means I could buy it outright, get a mortgage, and all that sort of stuff. I can pay cash, but here's another option: we could do terms. That's that's the thing. Instead of seller financing, say terms, or so, we can structure a deal that pays you out over time, which is going to be beneficial. So we could do cash, or we could do terms. And then they'll say, "Well, what does that mean?" Then you're able to explain a lot more. So I've just mm -hmm. found the term seller financing, unless they put it in Crexy, you know, in the title, <laughs> seller financing. Now, if you're a po let's say you're doing yellow letters to single family homes, and Somebody calls up and they're like, you know, mom and you know, mom and pop or you know, grandma. Yeah, I'm looking to sell. Well, that's great. And you start talking. You figure out what they need. They would rather have a little bit more money, a long term, as opposed to a, a quick buyout right now. Like, yeah. great. Well, we could do some terms on that. Do you know what that means? This is what I would say. We could, you know, I could pay for cash, or we can do terms. Do you know what that means? Oh no, I don't know what that means. Well, here's the option. What we could do is I could pay you over time. It basically explains seller financing. So yeah. That's something that I've seen work so much better than just say, hey, would you like to do seller financing? Yeah, especially for a single family. Most people who own single family, they're not business owners. And they, this may be the only property they've ever owned. And so they don't know. Um, and there's the, the same principle, I think, applies to commercial assets, just not as much, right? There, there's a, there's, they're more likely to understand 
payment terms or installment payments or and the 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 term they're more that we business use, oriented, which is really they tend right. to be, yeah, because they're running a business, right? Um, yep. So, but, but even so, a lot of them are not very. I mean, you would not consider them savvy business people. Um, I mean, they, they've made a living and they've covered, covered for their family, but they're not studying the theories of business. You know, like they're just running their business every day. And so, uh, I agree with the approach. One of the terms, or one of the the ways that we say it is, we'll make you payments over time. That's a great and, way to say it. And and they are like, well, okay, I think I know what that means. Tell me more. Just like you said, it's like, well, what does that mean? And when they lean in and say, what does that mean? Then that's when you're able to like broker that conversation versus, um, hey, I'll just do seller financing because I don't know. Because they don't know. They they either know what it means and says no, or they don't know what it means, and a confused mind says no. So. A hundred percent. And, but everybody listening to add to the, all that, like I, I, I reiterate the point, you need to know what the seller wants before yeah. you do anything. You want to show the seller that you care about them. Cause if you only care about the money, then you might as well not even, be, I don't think you should be in the business. You're, you're going to get eventually get pinched. If you're in the business to help people help the seller get out of whatever problem they have, you're going to be very, very successful. And they're going to come back to you and say, hey, my brother-in-law, he has the same problem. Referrals. Would you be able to help them? Absolutely, I'll be able to help them. <laughs> One of the terms that we say when we're talking to somebody is, what else you got? <laughs> what else you got? Uh, okay, you're selling this mobile home park. That's great. What, what else you got? You know anybody else has got anything for sale? for sale? <laughs> it's a great follow-up question. Everybody must ask that. Well, especially up from the South. So I can kind of lean into that. What else you got? <laughs> <laughs> hey, so um, what do you think about interest rates? I know it's kind of foreshadowed yeah. that interest rates are supposedly coming down for the next six months, at least, you know, yeah. September, they should be cutting. But what are yeah. your thoughts? Uh, the early indicator certainly seems like they're going to do a cut. It's going to be like 25 basis points. And I think they're going to be really slow about it. They raised interest really fast. They're going to lower interest rates really, really slowly. Yeah. So I think you, we get, we get one, maybe two in 2024 and they'll do however many they do in 2025. And they're just going to watch very slowly and very carefully, very similar to the way they had treated the last year and a half where they, they raised the a few times, but they did a lot much more slowly. The first few were so fast and so aggressive, right? Because, the, because they, they printed too much money. And so it, it affected inflation. <laughs> they sure right? did. Yeah, way too um, much money. And a lot of people say that, um, you know, they're waiting for things to get back to normal. Um, and so I think inflation has come back down to a more reasonable, modest uh, number, but prices are not going back down. Like inflation has happened. And, you know, whatever, you know, thing that you measure right now that, you know, that, that's whatever the, whatever the cost of that thing is, it's not going back down. Like it, it's, they've, they print the money, they've deflated the value of, of each dollar. And so that's not until they take money back, we can't fix that. You're hundred percent right. And if you think about it, inflation really started happening in 2021 yeah. and every year, some years it was like 10%, you know, and some months, like a so month, we're looking a at month. Now, yeah, yeah. a month. Yes. Um, and so we're looking at the total inflation for the last three years at least 20, maybe 30%. I'm noticing just like, oh my goodness, what in the world is this stuff? So just because it's not uh 10% anymore and it's only 3% increase, we still already up 30%. <laughs> so that's not going to help board. Yeah. across the board. Now here's a, a big key that I want everybody to realize because Paul and I, we don't worry about our interest rate that we get. And the reason why is because we're not paying the interest. Like I don't have to get a job and go pay the interest. We make sure that the deal works at whatever interest rate it, we get. I'll give you an example. I just bought a single family home. It's a short term Airbnb outside of Nashville. So it's not in the Metro area. So it's a yep. much less saturated market. It's doing great because it's not inside the Nashville, but it's about 20 minutes away. Now I got an 8% loan on a $420,000 house. I talked him down, got $20,000 in equity. Now here's the great thing. Even at 8%, I would not have bought it if 8% did not work. Sure. Does that make sense? Like, I it, it would not even, I don't care that it's 8% because my tenants are going to be paying for that. Now, here's the great thing. I'm making money at 8%, which is perfect. Same thing, I mean, multiply it out. If you got a large, you know, 50 unit apartment complex, if you're making money at whatever interest rate you have, if it goes up from 8% to 14%, you're going to be thanking the Lord that you got an 8% interest rate back then. Like, wow, I'm so glad I did it. But if it goes down, like it looks like it's going to, 
I'm going to refinance at a five and a half percent, hopefully maybe the next six months. So it might go down there right now. I could literally mm -hmm. refinance and get a six and a half. So I'll be really happy mm -hmm. at six and a half, but I'm, I, time's on my side because I see interest rates are going to come down. Once it gets to five and a half, I'm going to be saving like five or $600 a month in passive income or in, in just in cash. That's passive right. income back in my pocket. So no matter what the interest rate are, it's the deal that we focus on, that pays for not it. the interest rate. The deal's going to pay for it. Yeah. So basically it, we think about buying things in cap rates. And if you buy a property that operates at a 10 cap, you can borrow at 8%. If you buy a property that operates at a four cap, you can't borrow at 5%. Right? That's a good rule of thumb. I never yeah. thought of it that way. You have, awesome. you have to buy the the deal. Like if you're buy to buy at cash, what's your cap rate? What's your performance at other cash? Um, and then, then you run your numbers and figure out if what your cost of money is. And if your cost of money is, is ends up being more than your cap rate, then it, it will never cash flow. It's just I mean, because what we're doing is we're playing arbit we're, 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 we're arbitraging money between what we're buying it for, buying the asset that gives us this much cash back versus how much we're going to borrow money from. And when there's a, a gap there, we we get the, the benefit of the upside of it, right? And that's how you create cash flow. Then it might appreciate. Then you get a, a equity pay down, right? Then you get yeah, tax Yeah, absolutely. Advantages. Yeah, no, that's a, a great, great perspective. I do like how you have a quick gauge especially like if you have a huge apartment complex, you know, 50, 60 units, yeah. um, you have that where it's like, you know what? I need to get the price down because people might be thinking, well, I, I can't get that right now on any of these properties I'm seeing. Well, you need to negotiate. You need to get that price yeah. down because if you need to get that cap rate in the right spot for your interest rate, then you got to pay less. And this is what I talk about with single family homes. You know, somebody said recently that cash flow is a myth. Like you can't make cash flow. I'm like, well, only if you're doing it wrong. If you're paying top dollar, <laughs> like, yeah, or, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. I live on that. That's literally what yeah, I've been like, living uh... on for the last like seven years. And so, if you need to get the cash flow up on a property, you need to get the purchase price down. Or and if you can't do that on this property, you move on to the next one. Eventually, you'll find a property get the purchase price down enough yeah. so that the cash flow is high enough. Yeah. I agree with that. The only, uh, the only, um, maybe plus one out of that, or you get the right terms that creates the cash flow. Absolutely. Right? So because then I'm now borrowing at three percent, I'm borrowing from the seller's equity at three percent, right? And so now I'm getting a a six cap property, but I'm getting a three percent price of their equity back to me that's paid for with cash flow at six percent. Love it. Absolutely. Now, a lot of people think that seller financing is tough. Like, how do we? deal with the paperwork. Is it like something, especially with a larger complex that a title company takes care of the paperwork? Do you have to hire lawyers? Cause it seems like there's going to be a question. lot more than just a transaction. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so the same paperwork is used when you get a loan. Um, it's a promissory note and a security instrument, like a mortgage, depending on what state you're in, it might be a deed of trust. Um, and, and what we do is we usually do have an attorney draft it up. Uh, we have a, a format that we've used, you know, forever and ever. And then we take it to a, an attorney in that state and just make sure that whatever, whatever, whatever version of that works in that state. I say, you put your state stamp of approval on, on this uh, because sometimes the, the terminology and just the way they structure things are different. And, that way, the the seller feels comfortable that an attorney took care of it. Um, sometimes the title company will do it, but usually what they're doing is they're having the title company um, has an, uh, an attorney on staff that will step in and create it for you. Yeah. And um, it, what's what I love about it is you, you might be thinking, well, you're spending money on an attorney or you're spending money on this extra. Like, no, like they're going to make sure that you're not going to lose money in the end. That's what you got to look at. You're investing your money for the future. Just like I have some people say, man, do I really want to pay $300 for a home inspection on a single family home? Like, yes, yes. yes. that's going to say 300 bucks. That's nothing compared to what you could lose if you don't get it. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, what we're trying to avoid at all costs really is the risk of ruin and you don't want to get into any kind of deal that that's going to force you to lose your shirt because what happens when you, you lose on one deal, like the, the Going back to the, the monopoly analogy, if you have like we all we all played in a monopoly, and you're going around the board and you're buying everything, and suddenly you get tied on cash, and you got to start trading and selling your houses and your in your in your hotels. Ouch! And you never recover, right? You don't. 
Yeah. And that's what happens. It's really hard to recover in the real world. There's a lot of corollaries between monopoly and the real world. It's just simpler with monopoly. You can see it better. Um, but like once you start to have to sell your properties to like to to get your cash to pay rent to somebody else, then your you, your house of cards comes crashing down. Do you play monopoly with your kids? Uh, it's funny. I just bought an updated version of monopoly because I'm going to start using it in my short form vid videos. Um, and they, they asked me, it's like, Hey, can we play this? I was like, yes. Would you actually play monopoly with this? And they, like, yeah, we would. I was like, I'm skeptical. They're, they're 16 and 13. I think they're going to last about, <laughs> about 10 minutes, but we're, we're going to find out. My kids play it on their own. You know, they, they, they literally say, Hey daddy, can we play Monopoly? Please go right ahead. Can you play? I'm like, Oh, I got to I'm busy right now. Um, yeah. and Monopoly takes a while. And so it it's just, <laughs> and we homeschool our kids. And so it's a part of, you know, education. I mean, I'm totally so. fine with them. Totally. Taking, yeah. And so they love playing it. They love playing. Um, we play cash flow, uh, rich dad's mm -hmm. cash flow. Mm -hmm. They started with the kids version, which is so great for them to just get started at like, you know, eight years old nine years old. Oh yeah. And then they kind of get the picture. Now they're playing full cash flow, and they're learning how to the things that we're never taught, you know, monopoly, you're not taught in school cash flow. We're definitely not taught in school. And so now being able to bless my children with education and also the properties, I will literally give my properties the ones that I own free and clear or the ones that I, you know, I don't have to refinance or sell. Um, and so now I don't sell anything. I don't know about you, Paul, like what you tell me, like, what do you think when you have a residential, do you sell it? Because I, I find once I sell it, then I don't make that money and I can't give it to my kids. Yeah, I don't sell. I have a portfolio of about 40 rentals that I hang on to. And the only ones I sell are the ones that cause me a headache. Uh, you know how you know how when you buy, you go and buy 40 properties, uh, there's one or two of them that for whatever reason, just keep giving you a total hassle. You know, like, and so I just sacrifice I, like once a year, or once every couple of years, I just like, I just go back and look at my portfolio. I was like, is there any of these that are just the, the, the 80, 20 rule or just causing me more headache and not providing me enough income? I'll, I'll sacrifice those, especially if there's some equity in there. So I can then take the equity and buy a property I think will perform better. The only properties that I've sold goes along the same lines of what you just said. I had a duplex that was just giving me a headache. It, <laughs> it was just so bad. I was like, you know, I hate selling it, but I went ahead and sold it. And I was relieved. I made a little bit of money. I didn't make a ton of money. I made, I don't know, 20% on, on, but that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted the relief of that burden of this property that just for whatever reason, I was not doing well on it. Couldn't find the right property manager uh, to, to do it right, whatever it might be. And so me, you know, keeping my hair from turning gray, that's mm -hmm. always something that I look for. <laughs> Dude, was sleep at night and I had to worry about this, this headache. Well, talk about sleep at night. Um, you, Let's let folks find out how they can come meet you in person and just see how energetic you really are um, at Real Estate uh, Wealth Builders Conference uh, for commercial real estate. Where can people find you? Yeah, awesome. So you can definitely find and come get and hang out with Paul and myself um, at the Real Estate Wealth Builders Conference, the multifamily commercial real estate investing. So go to rubcon.com, R-E-W-B-C-O-N, rubcon, rubcon.com, and on there, use the promo code Paul. If you use the promo code Paul, I'll literally give you 20% off of your pass. Our goal is to just help people to invest. And you'll see when you come to this event, the type of people that we bring together, just like Paul and myself, that are just giving, that just really want to help each other. Because in the end, Paul and I both believe as we help each other, I mean, a rising tide lifts all boats. So that's absolutely, definitely, uh, you need to be there at the event. So it's November 7th through the 9th, rubcon.com. I know Paul and I will put in the link in the description, but use the promo code Paul, I get 20% off. But then you can also find me on my podcast, Master Passive Income. That's a podcast I've been doing since 2015, I think. And wow. Paul, you've been on there a, you've been on there a number of times. So we got to get you on there again. And oh, sorry, I'm posting this on mine as well. But one quick last thing. So I've been working on Instagram and I love talking to people on Instagram. So you can reach out to me, DM me on Instagram, the Dustin Heiner, T-H-E, Dustin Heiner. And I know, Paul, I'm not that arrogant to be the the only Dustin Heiner. It's only <laughs> handle I could come same. up with. I, well, I mean, I, I have a the same similar problem is that I have a common name in Paul Thompson. So I had to do Paul David Thompson. And even that I can't get everywhere. It's like, I, I it's hard. Like I have the curse of a common name, uh, but, but I did manage to get Paul David Thompson on Instagram. So you can find me there as well. Um, and we, and we can, we can talk shop and figure out how to, uh, 
create our empires and build our, our little um, become real estate moguls, right? Absolutely. And well, so I, I'm releasing this on my show. So definitely share it with everybody so that my people can hear how else they can mm -hmm. find you. Yeah. So I am now the CEO of Real Estate 101. We specialize in commercial real estate. So you can find us at realestate101.com. And that's the, the numbers 101.com. And then you can find me uh, on Instagram at Paul David Thompson. Awesome. Paul, been great chatting with you, man. And as always, good hanging out with you. I'm looking forward to be able to hang out with you in November. Yeah. I, I, everybody listen to this. Come hang out with us in Denver. Looking forward to it.